Yeah, I'm going to give a condensed version of the seriousness of fearing God. Because uh, I'm finding out that in this country, uh, they don't fear God as much as they should. And it's because they don't know how to fear God. See, they've been, they've been, they've been, it's been kind of watered down, you know, it's like watered down in a lot of different ways. Like once saved, always saved and everything's fine. And that's a lie of the devil. That's not true. I'll turn to Luke chapter 12. Now, what I'm finding out is that throughout the Bible, all the times that Israel uh, rejected the fear of the Lord or didn't have the fear of the Lord, they ended up being punished. And I can't say that that won't happen in the United States. Now, up there where um, our friend uh, Sonia lives in D.C., I'm sure she can easily see that. I've been to D.C. We've been to D.C. And I tell you, it was, it was hard to find even a Christian up in that area. Uh, so what this seriousness of fearing God is, I'm going to clear it up because it means exactly what it means. It means to fear God. So looking at uh, Luke 12, let's look at verse 4. This is Jesus speaking. And I say unto you, my friends, that would be us as Christians, friends, be not afraid of them. Them would be the world. Them would be those in power that are demonized and so forth. Be not afraid of them that kill the body and after that have no more that they can do. But I will forewarn you. Now this is a warning. But I will forewarn you. And the reason it says forewarn and not just warn is you'll stand before God and he's going to say, you had no fear of the Lord. And you were warned, forewarned. But I will forewarn you whom you shall fear. Then it says, fear him. Notice it's in capital letters. I'm reading out of King James. Fear him. Who's him? God. Fear him which after he has killed. Yes, God kills. If you don't believe he kills, read the Old Testament. Whom uh, after he has killed has power to cast into hell. Then he says, yea, and he says it again. I say unto you, fear him. Now, the definition of fear which, uh, which is the Greek word phobio. That's where we get our English word phobia, which is also the same word as afraid that's used in verse 4. What it means is to be terrified or to some degree to experience terror. So in essence, what the scripture is saying is that we need to be terrified of being cast into hell. You don't see that a lot in this country. I'm sorry. And we need to fear, and it's with capital letters, the one who can cast us into hell. In other words, we need to fear God and him only. Now, what many theologians, teachers, and church leaders have done, and I'm referring to Christendom as a whole, not necessarily every single local body, but what they've done is that they've somewhat watered down the term fear so as it has the same meaning as the word reverence, and I've heard it which is, it kind of does in some cases, that's what it means. But not in this particular text that we just read. Because in verse 4, the Lord is referring to someone possibly being killed. In other words, he's referring to physical death as well as eternal death. If you're cast into hell, that's eternal death. So there is a seriousness implied that has a meaning far above the word reverence. See, as long as you just say fear of the Lord is reverence, everybody thinks everything's fine. I reverence God. I go to church. I reverence God. I pay my tithes and offerings. I reverence God. I, I help people. What, whatever. Now turn to Hebrews chapter 12, and I'll confirm what I'm talking about. It's nice when you have one scripture, and then you have another that, Sort of says the same thing, like a synoptic verse. Hebrews 12, we're going to read only two verses. My message is actually pretty short. I don't have a lot of scripture to read, one or two verses each time. Hebrews chapter 12, look at verse 28. 
Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, in other words, the kingdom of God will never be destroyed, let us have grace. That word grace is power, and I said many times, every time you see the word grace, substitute it with the word power. So what it says is, let us have power whereby we may serve acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. That means he's a God of judgment. Now, he's a God of judgment because he makes these laws, and once a king makes laws, he can't change them. If you, uh, if you study the kings in the Bible, like uh, the story of Esther, once the king made the law to uh, persecute and destroy uh, the Jews, he had to make another law to give them arms to bear. He couldn't change that law. Kings cannot change the law. They can only make another law to supersede it. So God is a consuming fire. And if you don't uh, have the fear of the Lord, then uh, he'll have to use that law that he said he's a consuming fire and he'll consume you it's that simple even though it's a terrible thought so according to this passage of scripture reverence and godly fear are two different entities with two different meanings by definition to reverence god is to do what god says but to fear god it's to know who god is See, once you know him as the God of judgment who has to do what his word says, you can fear him, and you should fear him. And who he is, and he's the God that will cast us into hell if we don't serve him with both reverence and godly fear. For he's the God who is the consuming fire, as reference in verse 29. Now, that's what the apostle Paul meant when he said that I may know him. See, We've read that and we've not understood it. What are you saying? That I may know him, I, that I may know he's a God of judgment, that I may know he's all these different uh, things, and that I may know he's going to have to uh, obey his own word and, and judge people. God will send you to hell. He don't want to, but he will have to if you're not a servant of the king. Now, go to Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10, and you'll find uh, the word fear, fear the Lord, it's all throughout the Bible. Uh, the children of Israel finally got the picture after God, you know, sends them into Babylon after they refuse to fear the Lord. And what God did is he was proving it to them. If you don't fear me, I will cast you into hell. Well, if, you didn't, if the Israelites didn't fear him, he would let another country overtake him, which Nebuchadnezzar did. Matthew chapter 10, one verse, verse 28. And fear not them, this is Jesus again speaking, and fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. In other words, we're commanded to fear God and not Satan. See, that's why they say it's just reverence. Fear, they think, is just of Satan. And reverence is God. That's not quite correct. Now, a corroborating scripture would be Psalms 89, verse 7, which I'll, uh, I'll read it for you. It says, God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints and to be held in reverence of all them that are about him. And in other words, God is to be feared by all saints and all churches, while at the same time he is to be reverenced by everyone that's in his presence. See, if you're not reverencing God, you may not be in his presence. If you're not in his presence, you may be one that really doesn't know him. You may be one of those that he'll say, depart from me, I never knew you, you workers of iniquity. Now, another way of saying this is, is reverence the Holy Spirit, which is the corporate anointing within the church, but fear God at all times, for he's the one who can cast you into hell. Now, most of the apostolic messages I preach, they aren't your necessarily up and happy messages <laughs> because I'm telling the truth according to the Bible. So it's kind of like what we have today is we have people that want to go to these churches where all they get is these happy, everything's okay type of messages. 
over and over and over again. They become addicted to these messages because when they walk out of church, they feel like there's, everything's okay. When it's really not. I mean, the Bible says they say peace, peace, peace when there's really no peace. That's where we're at, folks, in this country. And for those who might watch this video in another country, we're in the United States. Now, reverence is not godly fear. True reverence is the embracing of godly fear. In other words, if you fear God, you will automatically reverence him. Because if you have the fear of the Lord, you know he can cast you into hell. And you'll reverence him. Reverence him. Now, uh, turn to Exodus chapter 20 in the Old Testament. And I'll show you the purpose for having godly fear. Exodus chapter 20. Now, this is where the pre-incarnate Christ, you probably never heard it like that, but this is where the pre-incarnate Christ gives the Ten Commandments to Moses. I won't go into that message, that's another message. But it's where Moses receives the Ten Commandments, and we all know, we've all seen the movie and so forth, um, Ten Commandments. But look at verse 18. <clears throat> It says, and all the people saw the thunderings and the lightnings and the noise of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. See, they're up again next to the mountain because God called everyone. You probably haven't heard this before, some of you, unless you've heard these messages that I've taught. But he called everybody. He wanted to speak to everybody. But see, sin had entered the camp, so they couldn't get close to God. Fear had entered them, so they thought if they get close, they'll die. And you'll read that in a moment. But he called everyone. And no one would go except Moses. <laughs> kind of thinks, well, Moses was the only one that was living in sin. No, he was probably the only one that had the fear of the Lord. And all the people saw the thunderings and the lightnings and the noise of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they removed and stood afar off. In other words, hey, we ain't going near that. And you'll see the reason why. And they said unto Moses, speak thou with us and we will hear. In other words, we don't want to hear God. We don't want any prophetic ministry. You get the prophetic ministry and just tell us, Moses, and we'll do it. Of course, we know that failed. Everything Moses told them at times, just they wouldn't do it. And you say, why didn't they do it? You know, that was a big question for a long time. They saw the miracles. They saw the, they crossed the Red Sea. They saw all these things. Why were they still a stiff-necked nation? Because they lost the fear of the Lord. And they saw, uh, and they said unto Moses, speak with us and we will hear, but let not God speak with us lest we die. Now, if you read in Deuteronomy, um, I've taught on it before, there's scriptures where it says they're all uh, really just, they go, wow, we can hear God and speak to God and we don't die. And the next verse says this, if he speaks to us, we'll die. So what happened between those two verses <clears throat> Is that the fear entered in, the fear of Satan now. Fear of Satan re replaces the fear of the Lord. And they would die. Look at, uh, read on, uh, verse 20. And Moses said unto, peop unto the people, fear not. Now that's a capital fear. Fear not, for God has come to prove you, test you, if you really have the fear of the Lord. That's what the test was. Boy, did they fail. And that his fear may be before your faces that ye sin not. So according to this passage of scripture, the purpose of having godly fear is that you sin not. See, uh, we do deliverance on people that usually come out of the world and they've done so much sin. They've, they, they've invited in so many demons and so forth because they were never taught. And some of them were Christians or professing Christians. But they'd never been taught the fear of the Lord. And Jesus said it. You need to have it. So <clears throat> having this godly fear is so you will not sin. In other words, it's to keep us from sinning to the point of having no remedy. No remedy, and that's referenced in 2 Chronicles 36, 16. You can write this down. That's where God gave Israel over to Babylon, and I'll just quote it for you. It says, but they mock the messengers. All right. Messengers are apostolic people. 
In the Old Testament, they would have been the prophets. In the New Testament, they would have been the apostles. So they mocked the apostles. They mocked the prophets. They mocked the messengers of God and despised his words and misused his prophets until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people till there was no remedy. In other words, they were beyond help. Now, notice in verse 20 that we just read, it says, Fear not, for God has come to prove you, and that his fear may be before your faces, that ye sin not. Now, the reason it's stated this way is because there's two different types of fear. There's fear not type of fear, and there's his fear type of fear. You know, when the angels come and you entertain a certain fear, and they say, fear not, what they're doing is they're canceling out the fear that Satan would put on you because there's something supernatural happening that you don't understand. So when he says, fear not, that's an angel canceling out the fear that Satan puts on you. In other words, there's a spirit of the fear of the Lord, which is, of course, from God. It's his fear. And then there's a spirit of fear, its counterpart, which comes directly from Satan. See, what the church has been successful in doing is watering it down to where there's only one kind of fear. That's the fear of Satan, fear of the devil, whatever. Of course, there's kingdoms of fear. It's all controlled by Satan. And I say kingdoms of fear, we deal with that. Fear of this, fear of that, fear of dying, fear of insects, fear of snakes. It goes on and on. Now turn uh, to Isaiah chapter 11. And I'll show you more about this spirit of the fear of the Lord. See, when I used to teach things early in ministry, I just hear the Holy Spirit and I'd teach them and I wouldn't have all the answers. I wouldn't even know why he'd want me to teach it. Then later on you find out why. Because he was teaching it because it come from the Holy Spirit. Therefore, it was a serious message. Isaiah chapter 11, look at verse 1. And there came, and there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse and a branch shall grow out of his roots. That means uh, Yeshua is coming. Jesus is coming. The Messiah is coming. That's what it says. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge, and of what? The fear of the Lord. So according to this, the Holy Spirit is not only the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, and the spirit of knowledge, but he's also the embodiment of the fear of the Lord. In other words, the baptism in the Holy Ghost, evidence is speaking in tongues, as referenced in Acts 1.8, is the fear of the Lord. Because when the Holy Spirit permeates you, you have the fear of the Lord. Because he is that. Now Hebrews 5.7, you don't have to turn there. I'm going to quote it to you. And that's because it's, I'm going to quote it to you in the Amplified Version. It kind of says it more plainly than King James. Hebrews 5.7 says, In the days of his flesh... Jesus offered up definite special petitions and supplications with strong crying and tears to him who was always able to save him from death. That's Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane praying to the Father. We all know that story. And he was heard, means he was heard by the Father, by the Trinity. And he was heard because of his reverence towards God, and in parentheses it says his godly fear, then it goes on to say his piety and that he shrank from the horrors of separation from the bright presence of the Father. <clears throat> Excuse me. In that he shrank from the horrors of separation from the bright presence of the Father means that even Jesus, y'all pay attention because it's Holy Spirit given, that even Jesus knew that without godly fear, he himself would be in danger of being separated from the Father for all eternity. That's what it says. In other words, Jesus knew that in absence of the fear of the Lord, he himself could end up in hell. That's how important the fear of the Lord is. You know, um, Jesus could have easily ended up in, in, in hell if he didn't, if he would have sinned. And, if, and, and, and so that means that what Jesus is saying here, what it's showing is that 
to not have the fear of the Lord as a sin. Now, Ecclesiastes chapter 12, you can go there. That's, a, uh, that's the book after Proverbs, Ecclesiastes chapter 12. And this is um, Solomon, the wisest man that ever walked the earth, other than Jesus, wrote this. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, I'll give you a moment to get there. They're at the table here and still turning. It's right after Proverbs, that's the book. And it is the last chapter in uh, Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes 12, look at verse 13. Let us hear the con conclusion of the whole matter. <clears throat> He's talking about the whole matter of our relationship with God. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Then he goes, fear God. Fear God and keep his commandments. Then he says, for this is the whole duty of man. Our whole duty is to fear God and keep his commandments. No matter what the cost is, which Jesus paid the ultimate price. Otherwise, it could cost us everything, including our eternal soul. <clears throat> 